At Lakeside, we exist to help people move one step closer to Jesus and reach those who are far from him. That is what drives everything that we do. And we realize that one of the biggest obstacles that people face, not only in their relationship with Jesus, but in their personal relationships and within their lives, one of the biggest things that gets people sidetracked is this area of sexuality and relationships. And so over the course of the last few weeks, we've gone back and we've seen God's design for these things. And yet we understand that the Bible is, is relevant because it's God's revealed word to us, but also because it has practical things that we can put into place in our lives. And if we do that and we follow God's plan, it will lead us to the most rewarding life possible. And so over the course of, of the last few weeks, as we've talked about these things, there have been some questions that have come up in your minds, and we asked you to submit those so that we can talk about them specifically, and that's what we're going to do this morning. So thank you for everybody who took the time to send in questions. If we don't answer your question today and you want us to address it, feel free to send, send us an email. Email me directly. It's Brian with an I at lakeside-church.com, and I'll be more than happy to answer your question. We can have a conversation. If you want to do it and Anonymously, there is still the anonymous form where you can ask questions and then just make up an email address and put that in there and I will email the response there if you want it because we understand the nature of some of these is incredibly personal. And so if you want to do that under, under the veil of anonymity, we certainly want to respect that, but we want to get you the answer that you're looking for. So the first question is this, is there a specific age we should allow our children to date? Any recommendations on concepts for them to understand before dating? Well, thanks so much for asking. Personally, I'm a fan of not necessarily an age limit, but, but marks of maturity. And I think every kid is different, every teenager is different, every person's different. And so where one person can be incredibly mature at 14, 15, 16, there's other people who are incredibly immature at 27, 28, and 29. And... <laughs> And some of you know that because you married them. And don't point, no pointing, all right? Don't point it. Luckily, Brooklyn, my dear wife, is hanging out with the kids today. Otherwise, she would be pointing. But some people are, some people are incredibly mature earlier on in the process than other people. And so I think rather than put an age limit on it, it's, it's a wiser approach to go with, with um, a maturity level. Here, here's, the, here's the thing. I, I've worked with students. I have kids of my own. I realize that my kids are going to make mistakes in life. And my goal, I've, I've talked to you about this before, but my goal is not to raise good kids. My goal is to raise good adults who hopefully love Jesus. That is my goal. And so I'm going to let my kids fail. I'm going to let them fall on their face. I'm going to let them make some mistakes. Now, there's some mistakes I'm not going to let them make because I wouldn't be doing my job as a parent if I did allow that. But there are other mistakes that I'm going to let my kids learn the hard way because I know for me, I've had to learn a number of things in my life the hard way. It's been one of the best teachers ever. And so I don't want to be a helicopter parent in that I never let my kids experience anything dangerous or any pain, and yet I also want to be a responsible parent in that I, I don't allow them to do anything too dangerous, life-threatening, or allow them to do anything that's going to radically alter the course of their life. But that being said, I understand my kids are going to make mistakes, and I want them to make mistakes while I'm there to help them in their land. I want to provide them the softest landing possible to the point they still understand why they made a mistake, and they're going to experience some of the pain from that mistake, but where the mistake doesn't break them. Proverbs 22.6 says this, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so have an active part of parenting along with your kid as they're starting the dating process and talk to them about what they need to be looking for, what traits they find attractive, what things they need to be on guard for, and what things are non-negotiable. And as soon as they see signs of that, they are quick to break the relationship in the dating process. I believe dating is a process where you go through and you discover who you want to marry. And I don't think there's any one answer to that question. 
I, I'm not one of these people that thinks God has designed just one person, and you've got to discover that one person, or else you are outside of God's will. And you're, not only are you outside of God's will, but thank you, because you've now messed it up for the rest of us. Because your one person that you chose was really designed to be with somebody else. And because of your selfishness, now none of us can be with the one person that God designed us to be with. Thank you very much. Have a nice life. So I don't believe that there's one person that, that God, has, God has designed us us all uh, to, to spend the rest of time with, with apologies to the great Bon Jovi song, Born to Be My Baby. Now, that being said, date to discover who you want to marry. Date to discover who you want to marry. And one of, one of the things that I love that a lot of people smarter than I have come up with is this idea of going back to Scripture and one of the most famous parts of the Bible that talks about love is 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 4 to 8. And instead of, instead of reading love, insert the name of the person that you, that you have feelings for and see whether or not they measure up. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, Love never ends. And if you can insert the name of the person that you have romantic feelings for and say this is an accurate representation of that person, and certainly not everything. I mean, none of us are perfect, and we're all going to fall short. But if more often than not, the person that you have romantic feelings for measures up there, then you're probably on the right track. And if they don't, then break things off and break them off quickly because they're still putting their best foot forward. And if they don't measure up when they're making a concerted effort to put their best foot forward, just wait. Just wait. It's going to be a disaster. And so see if they measure up. And if they don't, that's the point of the dating process and the relationship. Too many people stick together in dating and say, no matter what, we're going to stay together and then get married and two years into it, call, call it quits and throw in the towel. We've got it backwards. And so be quick to end the relationship as you're dating, especially the earlier in the process. And, be, and then obviously once you're married, honor the commitment that you've made, but have incredibly high standards. Why? Because your heart is so vulnerable and it's so delicate. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Don't trust just anyone with your heart. And I know he might look fine, or I know she might be the most gorgeous woman you've ever seen in your entire life. But if they're not the right person, and if they don't value you, your heart will be unforgiving where your eyes will not be. So I think when it's a good time to allow teenagers to date is, is this. When girls realize that bad boys aren't cute. When girls realize that, and, and some of you, you you've, had to, you've had to live that out, and you didn't discover that until you, your 30s or your 40s, right? But when you realize that bad boys aren't cute, and they're not fun, and I think a good time for guys to, to date is when they realize that they need to elevate her above themselves. And when you start to understand those principles, I think it's a good time to to allow them to date. But that being said, very few people go through life marrying the very first person that they date. And so for those of you who who are struggling right now with a heartache and with heartbreak, I I want you to know that, that God understands. And not only that, but the Bible tells us that God is near to you in your hurt. Psalm 34, 18 says this, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. So understand this. If you're going to date, it's probably going to end at some point in time. And when it ends, it's going to hurt. But don't lose heart. And don't let that define you. And as a parent, I want to be there for when my kids have a broken heart so I can help them in the landing.
But that's my approach, and that's what I advise you to do. Thanks for the question. Question number two. I'm a step-parent and have one stepchild. There are times I step out of bounds on some topics. It's hard because I treat them as my own kid. Should I distance myself and treat the kid as my stepchild, or should I continue to treat the kid as my own and just be cautious about some topics? Well, first of all, thank you for your question. And second of all, thank you for loving your stepchild. And in, in, in light of everything else, I just, I just want to pause there and tell you thank you, thank you, thank you so much for loving your stepchild. I, I really believe this. You have the hardest job in the world. Your job is so incredibly difficult. It is so incredibly difficult just to be a parent. But then when you enter the dynamic of, of a broken family and, and now all, all of the things that that child has had to go through, you have by far, in my mind, the toughest job in the world. And I, I just want you not to lose heart. Give yourself some grace. Know you're not going to do things perfectly. You're going to mess up. You're going to make some mistakes along the way. But just pause and just understand what you have signed up for and what you are undertaking is an incredible undertaking. And you have all of our, all of our love because we understand how hard and how difficult this is. And as a church, we want to celebrate you and we want to come alongside you in this process and help you because we know that sometimes the road is going to be incredibly difficult. It's going to be rocky at times. And there are times you're going to feel incredibly isolated and incredibly alone. And we don't want you to have to go through this journey alone. So you have our admiration and our hats off uh, to you. And thank you so much for loving this child. Your role as a step-parent is going to have to evolve. It's going to have to evolve. You're going to have to earn that child's trust. It doesn't come automatically. It, it doesn't happen instantaneously. As a step-parent, you're going to have to earn that child's trust and understand when you're coming at this that the child is probably not going to be rational because children aren't rational. And not only that, but you have to understand not only are kids not rational, but on top of your irrational, as all kids are, the child's hurting and skeptical. And so you throw this into the equation, and it's just, it's, it's tough. So the most important thing that I would advise is this. You and your spouse must, must, must be on the same page. You must be on the same page. And don't allow this to drive a wedge between the two of you. Don't allow the tension and the stress and, and the heartache and this whole process, don't allow this to drive a wedge between the two of you. Now, if you start there, and that's the foundation, that you say, we understand that, that we are on the same page and we're not going to let this drive a wedge between us, let your spouse be the bad cop. Let your spouse be the bad cop. Ephesians 6 1 says this Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So, especially while you're building trust, let your spouse be the bad cop, not you. And I understand that can be very difficult because at times that's going to take patience, and at times you're going to have to bite your tongue. But especially early on, let your spouse be the bad cop. You, you guys, you have to be on the same page in everything that the stepchild can see. Now, that doesn't mean behind closed doors you're just blindly agreeing to everything. You guys can have it out behind closed doors, but just remember, they probably got their ear up to the register vent listening. So you might want to do it quietly or even via text as long as the stepchild can't read and doesn't have the passcode to your phone. But whatever you have to do to communicate, that's fine. But in front of the stepchild, there has to be a unified front. And then let your spouse be the bad cop. As, as I was thinking about this question, I thought, who is the, what is the best example that we would have of this? And it, it took me a while. And you might be like, well, you're an idiot, Brian, and you're right. Because Jesus had a stepfather. And like, as soon as I started thinking about this, Jesus wasn't the first person that came to my mind. And it took me a couple hours. And I'm like, Jesus, Jesus had a stepfather, yeah. <laughs> and then I got really excited. And then I was like, that should have taken me 20 seconds, not two hours. 
<laughs> not sure, not sure where the breakdown was there. But I want to go back to Jesus' birth. At a time we celebrate, but at a time that was incredibly chaotic in the lives of Joseph and Mary. I'm just going to read some verses from Matthew, and then I'm going to tell you what I think the point is in relation to this question. In Matthew 2, 13, Now, when they had departed, and that is the wise men who journeyed to worship Jesus, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And then we're going to fast forward to verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. What's the point? Joseph uprooted his entire life to protect his stepson. Joseph uprooted his entire life to protect Jesus. So as a step-parent, I would encourage you to love that child unconditionally. And you can choose that. You can't choose how the child responds and reacts to you, but you can choose how you love. And I would challenge you and encourage you, love that child unconditionally. Know that sometimes that love won't be returned. But you choose love. And that that sometimes that won't be returned because the child's hurting, because they're confused, but don't let them determine how well you love them. Be on the same page with your spouse Love them unconditionally to the point it inconveniences your life greatly. But you choose love. Thanks for the question. Next question. I discovered my child is looking at porn. What should I do? Well, the very first thing you should do is this. No, you aren't alone. No, you aren't alone. You're not having to walk through this by yourself and know that you're not the only parent in this situation. Porn has never been more accessible than it is now. And it can be found when people aren't even looking for it. So I want to caution you to take this seriously. But at the same time, don't overreact. And and let me explain. Take this seriously, but don't overreact. And so to illustrate this, I want to talk about two friends of mine and the responses that their parents had when they discovered that they were looking at porn. The first friend of mine, his parents discovered that he was looking at porn, and they took the bedroom door off of its hinges. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. All that does is drive the kid to make something that's already secretive even more secretive. And things that linger in the dark and things that are allowed to remain secret continue to fester and continue to grow. If you alienate your kid in this process, they will become even more private about it. And they will make what's already a private thing even more secretive. At the same time, don't minimize it. I had another friend whose dad discovered that he was looking at porn. And then he gave him a list list of websites to check out instead. 
Now, obviously, these are two extremes. So don't overreact and don't minimize it. Matthew 5, Jesus is talking and he says this, starting in verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that, uh, than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now, Jesus was speaking figuratively here, not literally. But what he's talking about is this idea of lust is a big deal. And so if you've discovered your kid looking at porn, then talk to your kid about sexual desire. Be open and and be honest with them. And and this is just the reality of the times in which we live. This isn't a male-only problem anymore. It used to be thinking, well, thank God I had girls and I don't have to worry about that. But every statistic shows us that almost as many young women are looking at pornography as as many young men. So this is no longer a gender-specific problem. Now, I grew up in the midst of a purity or abstinence movement where people would take virginity pledges that they wouldn't have sex until they were married. The, The problem with that is virginity is not the standard. Purity is. And so you need to talk to your kid not just about God's design for sex is that sex happens within marriage, but it, you need to talk to them about sexual desire and how God wired us. God wired us to have these desires. And when we choose to operate according to God's plan, it is one of the most fulfilling things and one of God's greatest gifts to us. And every time we choose to operate outside of God's plan in accordance with these desires, it ends horribly. Now, you may have to inconvenience yourself in order to put some safeguards in place with your kids. You need to check their browsing history. If you're paying for their cell phone especially, you need to have the passcode and you need to have access to what they're looking at and read up on what apps they're using about that they don't think you know about and chances are right now you don't know about but all kinds of things can go horribly awry within those apps and make sure that they're not using those apps. Don't allow them to have their own username and password. Do an app store where they can download things without you discovering it. It's going to take some time, and it's going to take some effort. And you're going to have to go outside of your comfort zone and outside of, outside of things that are going to be easy for you. You're going to have to be inconvenienced a little bit. And then realize, too, you can't make the decision for them. Just as in any other area of their lives, you may see the path that they're on and be incredibly upset about it and want something so much different for them, but you can't make the decision for them. Job 31.1 says this, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? And this is the truth of really all of parenting that we eventually get to the point where we understand. We ultimately can't make the choices for our kids. They have to make their own choices. They have to want to honor God with their sexuality. And it doesn't mean that you can't do some things to make this a lot harder for them and a lot more difficult, and yet at the end of the day, if they don't want to honor God with their sexuality, there is very little you're going to be able to do about it. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So I don't want you to feel defeated. Don't minimize it. Don't overreact. Talk to your kid about 
about sexuality without going into specifics. Don't scar them, but talk to them about their sexuality. Talk to them about God's wiring and God's design and acknowledge that sexual desire is a good thing. But that's only when it's done according to God's design. And when it's done according to God's design, it is one of the greatest gifts God has given us. And yet every single time that we step outside of that design, it ends horribly. And nothing will derail your life faster than getting this area of your life wrong. Your job is incredibly difficult as a parent. So pray for your kid like crazy. Set a good example for them. Be honest and open with them. And put some things in place that is going to make it more difficult, certainly. But understand that ultimately you can't make their choices for them. So your job is just to keep pointing them to Jesus. And point them in the right direction. Question number four. Is Hebrews 13.4 talking about not having sex before marriage, or not being adulterous? Is there anywhere else in the Bible that references not having sex before marriage? Well, the quick answer is both. Hebrews 13, 4 says this, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Now, the, the whole point of saying the marriage bed undefiled... That means that everything that happens sexually outside of that bed is defiled. So sexual immorality is anything sexual outside of marriage. And we go back to God's original design for marriage and sex to see this. And that's all the way back in Genesis 2, starting verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so the pattern we see here, according to God's design, is that they set out together, they leave behind the family that raised them, that they are committed together, that they hold fast to one another, and only after this process, they start a new family, they are committed, only after this process occurs are sexual relationships to happen. When we follow this plan, we can be freaky and guilt-free when we follow this plan. Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. They, there was no guilt there because they were, they were operating according to God's plan. 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 15, says this, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Now you might say, well, that doesn't really apply to me because I'm not charging. The point isn't the transactional nature here with Paul talking about prostitution. It's the action. We are joined together with whoever we sleep with. This is God's design. That two people come together and are united together as one. And we have this incredibly backwards in our society, where people are quick to give away their bodies, and yet slow to commit. It's, it's incredibly backwards of God's original design and intent. Where today we operate, where so many are so quick to give away their bodies and yet so slow to commit to another person. If someone won't commit to being united with you for the rest of their lives, they don't deserve your body. Value yourself. You have intrinsic value. You have intrinsic worth. And don't sell yourself short. 
And someone making a promise or a, or a vow and saying, we'll, we'll be together forever. We just, we don't need to get married. That's so old-fashioned. Why, why do we need to worry about it? Because it's God's design. That's why. You may say, but, but we're engaged. Or, or we're in a really committed relationship. But marriage is the standard for God. Because that's what he designed. Jesus was speaking to a woman one day about a number of spiritual issues. And he was answering her spiritual questions. When in John 4, 16, Jesus said to her this, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. The whole reason Jesus raises this issue is because there she was in her life operating outside of God's standard, operating outside of God's plan. And so you may say, well, if if we got married, you don't know what that would do to our social security benefits. And I would just ask, is God bigger? Can God work it out? You may say to yourself, well, we don't need to get married. We're committed to one another. What difference does it matter? It matters to God, your creator. And your designer. Sexual attraction is part of God's design for us. It is a gift for us but operate according to God's plan. That is the path to fulfillment. That is the path to being naked and unashamed. That is the best course of action that God will ultimately bless you with in your life. But what about those of us who've blown it in some area or another area of this? What about the person who's looked at porn? What about the person who slept with somebody outside of marriage? What about the person whose marriage has has fallen apart? What What about that? And we've said that this is this is the area that can derail your life faster than anything else. And yet we serve a God who's bigger than our failures. We serve a God who's bigger than our mistakes. And God is not repelled by you individually. He is repelled by some of the choices and decisions that we make. And yet he still loves you incredibly. So my encouragement to you is don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. And don't quit. God's love is enough. And his grace is sufficient for you. And if you've made mistakes in this area, so is pretty much everyone else. And God still loves you. And he can forgive you and restore you. But start today to choose to follow after Jesus. Because his plan will lead you to the most blessed life you could ever imagine. God, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you would help us follow you. Certainly in the times that it's easy, and definitely in the times where, if we're being honest, we'd rather not. We'd rather do things our way. Or we'd rather elevate our pleasure over your plan. God, I pray for each one of the people who asked asked these questions today. And God, for the parents who want to set their kids on the right path, I pray that you'd give them wisdom. And for the kids as they start the dating process, give them wisdom and help them value themselves. For parents and step-parents, 
God, just that you would give them patience and resolve and that they would choose, always, always, always choose unconditional love. God, for the parents that discovered that their kids are accessing porn, that you would just give them grace. Allow them to have some tough conversations. We pray, God, along with them that their kids would choose to honor you. And God, where there's guilt and regret, we pray that that shame wouldn't fester there, but instead grace would operate. And they would choose to follow you instead. And God, for the couple that wants to step outside of outside of your plan or is tempted to step outside of your plan or just wants to really understand even more of your plan for sex, I pray that they would choose to do things your way. And that's my prayer for all of us. And whatever areas we're struggling with, God, I pray that you would give us the grace to choose your way and you would help us follow after you, that you would be glorified in us, through us, and in spite of us. God, work on our hearts. Make us more like you. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.